coming up on Conversations and Bionics on Pain. When DARPA decided to fund a major effort to improve prosthetic arms for amputees, you know, as a result of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were asked to be one of about a dozen different groups that they brought together in this DARPA program to produce a next generation prosthesis. And we were asked to do the control and systems modeling. So it's our expertise. And then there were groups there who knew about batteries and motors and sockets. And, and so they had realized correctly that it was essential to have tactile feedback. And they had uh, a couple of groups that you know, were representing that. So I was at the kickoff meeting where they brought all the groups together and some external consultants. And I was sitting next to Roland Johansson, one of their oh. consultants on tactile sensing. And the groups that were going to provide the tactile sensors for this very aggressive, very expensive four-year blitz development presented the technologies they thought would make for good tactile sensors. And I looked at Roland and Roland looked at me and said, these guys are nuts. <laughs> None of these technologies measures what you need to measure in a finger. They all assumed that touch was sort of taxels, you know, normal force right. sensing arrays. And they were all sensing technologies that involved, you know, little cantilevers of MEMS and little gold wire leads and, you know, things that wouldn't survive, you know, five minutes in a real environment, like washing dishes. Right. So, you know, we were sitting in the bar afterwards, sort of getting drunk and commiserating about having signed on with such a bunch of fools. <laughs> And I said, well, so Roland, you know, let's talk about how tactile sensing and skin really works. And he started mentioning and I started thinking and we started sketching literally on a cocktail napkin. And we came up with the idea for what is now the biotech, a tactile sensor that senses the deformation of the skin without having to have active electronics or any leads at all in the skin. Because, you know, the skin's going to wear out and have to be mm -hmm. replaced. It's kind of a no-brainer. We came up with the technology of biotech. In fact, we started to realize this might be a useful invention. And we actually had the, the cocktail napkin witnessed by the guy at the next table who was the FDA representative. <laughs> oh, those, those are good bars to hang out. Welcome to Conversations on Bionics and Pain. I'm Dr. Max Ortiz Catalan. I'm the director of the Center for Bionics and Pain Research which is a multidisciplinary engineering and medical collaboration between Chalmers University of Technology, the Salgoransky University Hospital, and the Salgoransky Academy at Gothenburg University, all in Gothenburg, Sweden. This podcast is about the combination of medical and engineering technologies to restore human function and alleviate pain. But it's also about the people who are making these efforts and their stories. If you're a student interested in these fields or a professional considering changing career path, this podcast will be interesting for you because we not only talk about science and technology, but also the background and career path of all my guests. And if you're a researcher in the field, the long format of these conversations will probably be interesting for you as you'll get to know the context in which a lot of the advances in our field happen. In addition, there will be also shorter episodes dedicated to interesting scientific articles. So welcome to the show and feel free to subscribe and reach out if you have any comments or suggestions. Our first episode is with Dr. Gerald E. Lobb. He's a professor in biomedical engineering and neurology at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles in USA. He has written hundreds of scientific articles and he holds about 70 patents. Throughout his career, he has worked in different neuroprosthetic devices. He was behind the Bion, short for Bionic Neuron, which is a small capsule that can be injected into muscles and then from outside the body, it can be powered via telemetry and make it deliver electric pulses to contract the muscle. So for patients who cannot activate their own muscles, this device can be used to artificially activate those muscles and thus it's what's known as a motor neuroprosthesis. Unfortunately, despite of decades of research and several successful clinical trials, this device is not yet available as a commercial product, and we discuss some of the reasons why. Dr. Lobb also led the team behind the first multi-channel cochlear implant. Cochlea is the sensory organ that allows us to hear. It transforms pressure waves that will make sound into neural signals that allows our brain to create the experience of sound. And he was also involved in some of the first visual neuroprosthesis, utilizing electrodes array to stimulate the visual cortex. So as you can hear, he's been working on interfacing the human body at different levels. 
If you think about vision or hearing, for example, the retina and the cochlea transform light or pressure waves into neural signals that are transferred via nerves to the brain so our brain can create the experience of vision or hearing. So you have the sensory organ, you have the connection to the processing part of the brain that makes the experience, and that connection is via the nerves. And because of this, you can interface with the nervous system at the sensory organ that will be placing an electrode in the cochlea or the retina. You can do it by placing an electrode in the connection to the brain, so that will be the cochlear nerve or the optic nerve. Or you can do it where the processing in the brain happens, and that will be the auditory or the visual cortex. And there are advantages and disadvantages depending on at which level you want to interface the nervous system. But the overall objective is the same. Input or extract information to restore some sort of function. So in addition of speaking about the science and the technicalities on all these developments, we also discuss the economics and the politics that go around doing clinical implementation of these technologies. We discuss what is the purpose of doing a PhD and what are the career options once you have one. And at the end, we conclude the interview with a bit of a discussion on the human body as a machine and what one should keep in mind when selecting the kind of job that one does. So here is the conversation with Professor Gerald E. Lop. As a starter, would you mind talking a little bit about your career path? I understand you had an education in medicine and then drifted to engineering or, or biomedical engineering. How did that happen? So I've always been interested in how things work. So figuring out how to fix the human body is sort of the ultimate uh, fix-it problem for engineering. Never planned to be an engineer, but I got involved in research very early on as an undergraduate and continued when I was in medical school. I was in an accelerated program that at Johns Hopkins that uh, allowed you to get into medical school after two years of undergraduate and then a five-year program with some extra research opportunities. Uh, and that led to some really interesting experiences in developing novel neural interface technologies, both for research and involvement in the visual prosthesis project, which uh, has a long and interesting history. Uh, so by the time I had finished medical school, it was already clear that I was going to stay in research, and I had already developed some strong ties with folks at the National Institutes of Health, the Laboratory of Neural Control, which funded a lot of neural prosthesis development for like 30 years. Uh, and they had offered me a position uh, as the effect of, of a uh, postdoctoral fellow. But I wanted to get at least one year of clinical medicine under my belt. So I went from Hopkins to a surgery program at the University of Arizona. Uh, so I could get practical experience in not just uh, how physiologists and anatomists open things up to study them, but how you close them up so they can walk away afterwards, because I was very interested in chronic neural interfaces that would allow us to study nervous system function in animals that were actually behaving. Uh, at the time, there were really almost no uh, chronic electrode, microelectrode technologies for recording single units in mobile animals. So after a year of uh, surgery, where I had some interesting opportunities to work with uh, Phil Gildenberg, the, sort of the father of stereotaxic neurosurgery, I went to NIH and spent uh, 15 years there. Uh, gradually you know, set up my own sub-laboratory. It's called a section uh, within the lab of neural control and do most of the work there on using those neural interfaces to understand how motor neurons and spinal cord afferents provide information about ongoing gait in cats and worked uh, because of my connections to microelectronics and neural interfaces, uh, was very involved in the cochlear implant project at UC right. San Francisco. Right. And after 15 years there, I realized that NIH was a bad place to be for the rest of your career, uh, because even though you have this wonderful sort of hothouse of uh, funded laboratory, uh, no grants to write, no, t no students to teach. Uh, if you want to branch out and do more than what your laboratory is already funded to do, that's actually an obstacle because you can't write a grant to do something else. And that's what led me into academia, moved to Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, largely because of my very close collaboration with Frances Richmond. Uh, she and I had worked together for several years at that point on studying how muscles uh, and neurons are used in the head and neck system. Uh, and she became my wife. 
Uh, so after uh, 12 years at Queen's University, the two of us would continue to be involved in a lot of <clears throat> medical device development. That's where I started uh, work on the Bion, uh, the injectable neuromuscular stimulators. Right, right. Uh, and we got very much involved in clinical trials and regulatory issues about that. Uh, so we had an opportunity to move to University of Southern California. And both of us were actually the first faculty in an institute that was set up here for biomedical engineering, mostly to develop, uh, to accelerate the development of medical devices uh, from the basic science to the clinical environment. Right. Yeah, so that's been uh, quite a path. I find interest. You were in, at NHS and then moved into academy, and that's normally not an easy move because if you want to go into academy, you need to apply for grants, and if you want to get grants, you need to have papers published and so on. But I'm guessing because you were publishing within within your time in NHS, you you have certain curriculum that make it possible to switch to academy and still get funded. So NIH was a very good place for me to be for the first few years of my research program. Because the development of these chronic electrode technologies and uh, all the supporting electronics and, and behavioral materials that went with it was extremely time consuming. And my productivity rate for the first few years has probably been a disaster if I had to come up for tenure in an academic institution. <laughs> but it meant that by the time I was ready to leave NIH, I had a very strong publication record and involvement in a number of interesting neural prosthetics projects. So uh, it was a good fit. Uh, for academia, it was scary because you're absolutely right. Suddenly, you have to you know, write grants, fund a laboratory, uh, even teaching students, which I hadn't really done before. And right. Giving international lecture, lectures to my colleagues for, you know, for 15, 20 years by that time, but, you know, undergraduate students. Oh, my God, what am I supposed to tell them? Yeah, I personally find teaching rewarding, but at the same time, it's time consuming. So it can be difficult sometimes to maintain a research program that is time intensive while at the same time teaching. Well, I, you know, I, I see it as part of the profession. You know, if you're going to be a professor, you need to profess. And so teaching is part of the job description. Um, in fact, I think our de-emphasis of teaching and emphasis on grantsmanship and bringing in dollars is to somewhat debased the academic environment. And I think uh, right. that's unfortunate. I also do a lot of teaching uh, self-defensively. Um, I see the undergraduates as the opportunity to recruit the best and brightest right. uh, into my lab as graduate students. And I want to make sure they know the fundamentals. So I teach them. Yeah, I think that's a common thing between most of us in academia. Um, so when I started in the field of neuroprosthetics, one of the first papers I read was about the bion, the bionic neuron. And I thought it was a great technology and it really solved some of the issues that you'll have with um, centralized units for neurostimulation. And if I understand correctly, the similar technology, at least the same packaging is used for the IMIS, the implanted myelectric sensors, that yes. uh, it's a device that is used for recording rather than a stimulation. Uh, well, we actually developed a glass package. I believe the IMES folks are using the ceramic package, right, which was right. yep. an alternative. It was the same concept of a cylindrical injectable hermetic package. The glass package actually rose from my work with the company on the you know, injectable biochips, RFID chips for animals. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually one of the inventors of those for in work I did with oh. a private company. Uh, and we developed the glass encapsulation process for them. And then that was used for the for the working humans later on. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, um, a telemetry device has no electrodes sticking out. And right. it turned out to be a real challenge to add hermetic seals to electrodes. Uh, we succeeded and we uh, did clinical trials with those devices for several years. Uh, but I think at the end, because... At the time, ceramic packages were not practical when we first started developing the Bion, but gradually the ceramic technology made it possible to develop those tiny and hermetically sealed thin wall packages. Right. So what was the state of the art on neural interfaces when you saw the need of, um, of the Bion? So people have been working on functional neuromuscular stimulation to reanimate paralyzed limbs for, I don't know, about 50 years now. Yeah. And there really are not even yet any 
uh, clinically available solutions that involve implantable systems. The state of the art was, and still is, largely uh, either transcutaneous electrodes, deep TENS, uh, which gives you a lot of skin activation, which is unacceptable in most patients, and rather poor control, a lot of problems with reproducibility and, and activation of, of muscles that you can't differentiate. Uh, so that technology was not really a starter for any kind of sophisticated movement or even much of rehabilitation. The alternative was the work that they did for many years at Case Western Reserve with these complex multi-channel, essentially a multi-leaded pacemaker-like device. Right. And of course, if you have to get to you know six or eight or 10 or 12 different muscles, uh, the routing of those leads and attachment to the muscles is a huge surgical imposition, which and and leads to the potential for breakage and infections. So again, for a lot of the rehabilitation applications, uh, it's way too invasive to be acceptable. And we were thinking, you know, at, it, I spent a large part of my career studying sensory motor coordination. So it was rather clear to me that what you needed to have to restore functional, complete functional movements like reach and grasp or locomotion was not in the cards. It was not just a matter of stimulating muscles. We've known that since Galvani, for Christ's sake. Uh, you know, the problem is to get fine control. And right. the nervous system has this huge amount of sensory feedback, mm -hmm. um, proprioceptive and cutaneous, as you well know. Uh, which uh, is essential. I mean, there's more than 50 times as much sensory information coming back from a limb as motor control signals going out to it. Right. So it's clear it's important, and we had no technologies for doing that at the time. So we focused on the applications where you could stimulate muscles to overcome the effects of disuse atrophy. A lot of bad things happen, not because the limb is paralyzed, but because the muscles never being used become right. atrophic. Right. Um, so you, you get contractures, uh, venous stasis, loss of cardiorespiratory function, you know, just a whole slew of bad things happen when muscles aren't used at all, which is would be easily restored if you had some minimally invasive, easily applied way that people could exercise those muscles at home without having to come into a clinic. So I remember seeing a, a series of papers of the Bayon from that time. And what happened with that development? So, so I'm guessing that started as an academic development, and then you needed to have some sort of industrial partnership to take it to the next level. Um, and now I read that continues with uh, new steam. Is that the next thing for the Bayon? It's a new version of the technology that I developed really as a commercial project with a company based in China. Uh, we target it, uh, well, so first we have to understand why the buy-in has yet to become a commercial product. Right, right. So that's an important part, yeah. <laughs> uh, and a lot of that has to do, I mean, we know it works. We had, you know, over 100 patients in eight different clinical trials, small pilot studies that uh, got benefit measurably and very much liked the usage. Um, but it's somewhat at war with the business model of uh, medical devices and medicine in general, particularly in the US. Uh, so the costs to develop and get regulatory approval for a class three medical device, which these devices are, even though they're very safe and minimally invasive, uh, are huge. And companies expect to recoup that by being able to charge $20,000 for an implant. Right. And our whole notion was that these implants would be less than $1,000 a piece. So that's immediately a huge an, an issue, yeah. problem with companies that are thinking about a business plan. Then the physicians, so the question next is, who's going to inject them? You know, Surgeons are the people who normally see the kinds of patients who would get this intervention. And they make money by admitting patients into surgical care facilities and charging money for surgery. So right. when you tell them, you know, instead of all that expensive nonsense, here's a device that costs us $1,000 and you can implant it as an outpatient procedure in 15 minutes. They say, why would I want to do that? So that's pretty much what yeah. happened. The main audience for this podcast is the students or younger engineers. And 
I hate to discourage them with reality, but that's something you have to think about. Right. So you have to be aware. It's not always just about having a perfect technical solution, but you have to look at the economics of that solution and the politics around it. And I would say- I teach this to my students. And and one of the things I tell them is, you know, the fastest way into bankruptcy court is three PhDs with a really good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But there are ways, right? So it's a problem. The way I see it is that is as another challenge. So we used to dealing with engineering challenges, and this is a, a human societal kind of challenge. And and I think if you approach it as a problem that needs to be solved, you're in a better mind frame to to react to it. That if you just get frustrated by saying like, well, you know, this is unfair and things like that. Well, let me continue with how this managed to fail because we actually had an industrial partner that was sponsoring uh, the development and clinical work. So the question is, we saw as a huge advantage that the Bion was a generic implant. Mm -hmm. It could be applied to a large number of different clinical disorders, the same technology. You wouldn't have to re-engineer it like you do when you turn a pacemaker into a deep brain stimulator or or a cochlear implant or a spinal cord stimulator. They're all, you know, one-off devices. But this is a generic device could be used for all the different muscles and all the different parts of the body that are suffering disuse atrophy for all the different clinical reasons. We saw that as a huge advantage. Turns out that's actually a fatal flaw in business development. Our industrial partner first said, well, rather than picking the application that you think is going to be easiest to get into clinical approval, we're going to pick the one that looks like the largest market. Mm. So then they start working on it. And of course, it's much more difficult than they thought. And after, you know, they think, you know, we're going to do this in three years. And then after three years, they haven't, they're nowhere near their goal. By that time, you have a new vice president of research and development who comes in and says, oh, well, you're having all this trouble because you picked the wrong clinical trial. We're going to try a whole different <laughs> clinical application. So you just try a new one. Well, you know, again, anytime you're in a clinical trial, it's going to take longer and cost more than you thought. And after a couple of years, you know, that one isn't looking so good either. Now, if you've got a cochlear implant and the only thing you can treat is deafness and you're behind schedule and over budget, you just keep going because you have no alternative. You can't change your mind. You either finish it or or die. And that wasn't true with the buy-in. So that was a fatal flaw. So then we said, okay, look, we got to get out of the U.S. healthcare system where people want to charge a lot of money and do expensive procedures. And we need to engineer the minimal device rather than some of the complexity we built into the Bion so it could accommodate all these different applications. Let's come up with the simplest possible design that would be targeted at a very specific problem that needs high through high throughput patient care in an environment that needs to do that. So that's how we picked stress urinary incontinence uh, and, and China. So this is a huge problem. People don't talk about it much. It's not as glamorous as making paraplegics walk, but it's actually a much bigger problem. Uh, Something like 30% of postmenopausal women uh, will have substantial disabling amounts of urinary incontinence just from the fact that their external urethra is too weak. Mm. And it's been known since the 1950s uh, when Arnold Kegel developed Kegel exercises, pelvic floor training exercises, that if you could just strengthen the muscles, most of that goes away. But it's very difficult to be, get people to do the exercise properly. It's right. not like weightlifting where you can see what you're doing. Right, right, right. And most people exercise because it's a social experience, but you can't do pelvic floor training exercises <laughs> you know, like you would you know, do, do uh, yeah. cycling or something. So this needed to be something that was foolproof and easy. And so we developed this extremely simplified version and got a company in China, trained their people here, set them up there, taught them how to manufacture the simplest possible technologies that we could come up with targeted to just this application, got rid of the hermetic package, which is a real challenge technically, and used epoxy instead because these devices only have to survive in the body for a few months of exercise. Once you strengthen the muscles, patients don't seem to any longer have the problem. And, And we got two clinical trials started in China. And that's when we discovered there were essentially no physicians, urologists in this case, who knew anything about real research. Oh, 
you know, when yeah. when they think about doing clinical trials of medical device, they're talking about a medical device that's already been used around the world. They probably trained on it in their residency in the U.S. or Europe, and now they just have to get through the clinical trial to produce the same result everybody already expects to get clinical approval there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not really research. It's no. just what answer do you need? I will get it for you. What result do you need to get approval? And that mindset does not work when you're trying to pioneer a new treatment. You don't yet know what the schedule of stimulation should be, what the best outcome measures will be, how long it needs to be administered. Right. Can they get a ride with a unilateral device or they need two for bilateral? Mm. You know, these are research yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Just, you know, couldn't get these busy urologists to even bother to be trained on what they were doing to implant the devices properly, much less collect reliable data to do research. So that's kind of bogged down as well. But things eventually have a way of coming around, I hope. It's only been 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a bit surprised that it's considered a class three device because it's, uh, since it's not supporting a life and, and it's out in the periphery. It's long-term and implantable and it generates energy in the body. And those two things are by definition class three. Now we probably right. could have it down-regulated to right. class two. That's another problem, a quirk. You would think that would be a good thing. Sure. But if a company wants to make sure that it has a lock on a market, mm -hmm. a good way to prevent competition is to let something stay class three. Right. To increase the barrier of um, entering, exactly. of course. Well, it's unfortunate because it seems like a great technology. The I miss, you can argue, is a similar story, but fortunately, at least now, that's been adopted by Osur and they planning to commercialize it, which I think will be good for patients with um, amputations. But I, I think there are other applications that we we'll discuss that we can potentially exploit because the device, um, I still see it as a as a good feature that it can be applied in different conditions. I guess something that would be a little bit tricky to do, and I don't know if you have to do it, but removing the device could be complicated, right? So finding it and taking it out, that could be a challenge. So the question, of course, is why would you need to? Right. Uh, out of 150 devices that we wound up implanting in patients, only one was needed to be removed. It was a strange case of uh, we, this one was implanted next to the femoral nerve in the groin rather obese woman in our clinical trial in Milan. And uh, this uh, woman noticed that when she was sitting, uh, she would have a skin fold, she was quite obese, that sort of pushed against the device and seemed to push it up against the femoral nerve, so she felt a bit of irritation. Mm. And so she asked the surgeon to take it out. And, you know, it took him 10 minutes. It's a minor surgical procedure, assuming you find the device. They show up on x-ray, ultrasound, or anything else you might need to be sure where it is. They stay put after they're implanted. Um, it can be a little tricky to find them because they are so small. And if they're buried deep in a large muscle, right. uh, certainly when we've had to take them out at the end of our chronic animal experiments, it's, it's amazing how well integrated they are into the muscle and how inapparent they are. But you know, other than infection or a, a quirk like this, uh, there would be no reason to remove a foreign body that is no longer functional or ne or needed. Right. And, you know, if you did have some sort of infection or irritation, then you'd know exactly where the device was because essentially it would be sending up a flare. Yeah, I guess it would be mostly a safety feature to be able to remove it because of failure, but mostly, say, an infection and so on that you need to find it. And I broke my hand a few months ago, and I had some pins in my hand, and when they were removed, the surgeon used fluoroscopy. And of course, you can see it, but that's still a 2D image in a 3D space. Uh, so yeah. you still need to you know, <laughs> go back and forward and up and down and all directions. And doing surgeries in, in some of the patients we do that had, a, say, a traumatic amputation when there's a lot of scar tissue can be very tricky to find them. So we discussed maybe to have, in, in such kind of devices, to have some sort of thread or lead that is a bit more superficial that you can find easily and then kind of like pull it from there or have a better navigation system to localize them, because otherwise it can be a bit tricky to find them in a, in a volume. For these devices, I mean, the Bion has a self-resonant coil, and it would actually be rather simple to design an inductive probe that would 
be able to, you know, something would sort of go beep, 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 like a metal detector it. Yeah. when it encountered that resonant frequency. Right, right. So I wanted to ask you this, but you mentioned it as well. You work on the first cochlear implant to some of the, was it the first or one of the first cochlear implants? Yes. Uh, so there were several projects in the U.S. dating to the late 60s and early 70s uh, to build a cochlear implant, all led by otolaryngologists who really didn't know much about neuroscience, but took a crack at it, got some sort of encouraging results. Uh, and when the NIH got wind of this, I was then an intramural scientist, uh, they decided to fund some partnerships between the clinicians and engineers and neuroscientists to try to get some decent development work going. So I was tapped to be the project officer on contracts that the U.S. led to one of the teams at UCSF, right. uh, which... Robin Michelson had started, but was really being led now by Mike Mer Michael Mersnick, mm -hmm. who's a well-known neuroscientist, and then the group at Stanford under uh, Bob White. Uh, and so those two groups I was the project officer for, and the idea was to get the engineering team at Stanford to work with the scientists at UCSF, and that didn't work. Uh, they didn't speak the same language. They didn't even like each other. <laughs> that can be problematic. And, so at, at one point, uh, you know, the folks at UCSF had some great ideas, but absolutely no engineering. And they were hoping that a company would come along and build the device for them. And they'd, I, I'd gone with Mike to visit uh, the company they had selected, which was uh, based here in Southern California. And it was clear that that was a hopeless prospect. There wasn't a chance they're going to be able to build this kind of technology, which, of course, no one knew by that time. And so Mike asked me to lead the team and I commuted from Washington, DC, NIH to uh, San Francisco for about three years and oh, wow. sort of put together the team that built the first true multi-channel implant. Um, you know, shortly thereafter, the folks in Australia who became the first commercialized cochlear right. implant, Nucleus, uh, the, the, uh, got together uh, the group in Melbourne with a pacemaker company mm -hmm. and you know, produced a device, I think, that was certainly inferior and not truly multi-channel to the UCSF, but had the advantage of already being tied into an industry that could do the kinds of sophisticated engineering that was necessary to turn it into a product. Right. We have spoke a little bit about how difficult it is to bring even good ideas into clinical implementation, but I think the cochlear implant is maybe the other side of the coin. I guess it's the first successful neuroprosthesis, you can say, that went commercial and it's a, you can say, a commercial success. And now there's more than one company doing uh, cochlear implants. So there's cochlear, of course, and there's Oticon. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. It's, it's both the, I think, most successful of the real transmission neural interfaces. There are a lot of neuromodulatory things uh, that are you know, extremely important clinically, spinal cord stimulation, right. deep brain stimulation, but they don't really transfer real-time information. They just try to tilt the function of something by modulating it. Right. And a real, you know, real-time interface, the cochlear implant is the first and, and really only widely successful commercial uh, device. And also in many ways, the most complex because the spatial and temporal requirements of hearing are rather special. And the uh, the problems that had to be solved to just transmit, to pre-process and transmit sufficient information, to customize it for individual patients, uh, you know, to provide substantial amounts of power uh, in a device that has to work for decades. Right. Um, those are huge channels when we started on, challenges when we started on this in the, uh, in the 70s and, and really didn't get to commercial success until the 90s. It is a complex device, of course, but um, the cochlea is fortunately arranged by frequencies, especially so you can have an electrode that makes it a little bit easier, but of course still complex. What would you say is the, the holdup or visual prosthesis? That would be uh, the other one that's been tried a lot, and there's the, the implants and the retina, but you can also stimulate the nerve, and but of course the resolution is war. So that's actually the first clinical project I worked on. A visual prosthesis. Uh, 
Yeah, when I was still uh, a medical student at Hopkins, I had a contract from NIH to work on uh, on the cortical vis visual prosthesis. Uh, there were several, one, in fact, the first projects funded by the Laboratory of Neural Control contract program, uh, one of them went to Johns Hopkins to look at electrode arrays put into the optic radiation in the white matter of the cerebral cortex. And uh, through that connection, I wound up working with Bill Dobell at the University of Utah and built the uh, surface electrode arrays that were used in his rather ill-fated attempt to replicate the stuff that Giles Brindley's group did in the late 60s and got the whole ball rolling for the idea of a cortical uh, electrode array. And then when I was at NIH, we actually did the pilot experiments in neurosurgical patients undergoing resection of the occipital cortex, where we used the penetrating microelectrodes, floating microelectrodes, uh, and demonstrated that the problems you have with surface stimulation, which are essentially crosstalk and activation of interneuronal circuits, could be essentially eliminated by putting an array of microelectrodes in. And as you know, uh, the, the Utah array that Dick Norman developed was intended for exactly that application, inspired by, inspired by the problems we were having at the University of Utah when, when I worked there with uh, surface cortical stimulation. Um, now, that, was, that whole phase has come yet to nothing. Right. Uh, because putting in, so, you know, we, we were very lucky that in hearing, you only need, at, you need at least four channels, only four, to have understandable speech if you get just the right signals. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to six or eight channels, you pretty much saturated the, the information you need to just understand speech in a quiet environment. And there's still shortcomings, but you already have a highly functional prosthesis with six or eight channels. But if you think about vision, you know the coarsest display you could imagine is going to have hundreds right. of phosphenes. And so, you know, there, it was conceivable that you could make thin film electrode arrays. That's what I originally worked on. Uh, that you could plaster over the surface of the cortex to get hundreds of channels. But on the surface, the stimulation thresholds are too high, and the crosstalk is too big a problem, and you miss a lot of the cortex, which is down in mm -hmm. the jaw right. In, in the sulcide between the gyruses, particularly the calcar and fissure. So penetrating electrode arrays, in theory, avoid all those problems, but now you've got hundreds of channels and a huge wiring and feed-through right. and flexible <laughs> connectors and leads, and it just goes on and on. So nobody solved that problem. And in the 80s, Marco Mayan said, well, let's just go for the eye. And he's an ophthalmological surgeon, renal surgeon. Um, and demonstrated that you could get sort of fun, you know, phosphines at reasonable levels right. of stimulation uh, in the retina. And that, of course, led to Second Sight mm -hmm. and another company in, in Germany that tried to do something similar. Um, the problem with that is, again, crosstalk. You are on the surface. Now, it's the retinal surface, but all the axons of the retinal ganglion cells are coursing under the electrodes en route to the optic nerve. And so when you stimulate, you don't get punctate phosphines from retinal ganglion cell bodies. You get this flare of elongated and what, you know, uh, phosphines that, that reflect all the axons that are sort of near or under the electrode. Right. So that's a fundamentally limited problem. Uh, I think Second Sight has, has pretty much ceased operations. Uh, the company in Germany closed up shop about two years ago, mm. and we don't have a solution. No, no, no. For visual prosthesis after 50 years now. Right. Yeah, so I guess it's a combination of uh, there is a technical challenge and then the commercial interest at some point worse off than stop injecting funding. It's quite sad. I mean, of course, working in neuroprosthesis to see these companies stop working, and I had the same feeling with um, the freehand system, which seemed to be a good system. And, and from what I hear, um, patients were satisfied and so on. But the commercial well, business. You know, the, the surgery took up to 10 or 12 hours. The fitting and adjustment to deal with the constant changes that you get in neuromuscular systems mm -hmm. with exercise pretty much requires an army of 
therapists and, and engineers to manage and maintain. It's it's not practical. Um, it's you know, it was a brave uh, attempt at doing something useful, but it doesn't generalize outside a laboratory demonstration and a few a few patients by really dedicated teams. So that really is, you know, th these things have to be tried. Some will succeed, sure. some will fail. When we started working on cochlear implants, the leading scientist in the field of auditory neuroscience came to a cochlear implant conference and said, we were all nuts and should stop working on it. Yeah, but that you hear all the time, isn't it? <laughs> That's not, it's not some common you get people. Well, and you know, when, when Al Mann was convinced to fund advanced bionics, he said, oh yeah, this should be easy. You know, I, a few million dollars in about 18 months will have a working device. And it was 10 years later before they even became profitable. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's a tricky, but something that I found interesting, you have written hundreds of um, scientific articles, but you also hold, I think about 70 patents and you have worked extensively with companies and you have also a startup, some companies that I, I had the opportunity to visit Sintouch last time I was in California and thanks for the for the tour. What made you, you know, starting this company and moving into touch? Another example of things just happen in research. You shouldn't plan on having a career plan because <laughs> it's you know it's like the story about you know any any plan of battle you know does not survive first contact with the enemy. So in this case we had because we were interested in understanding neural control, we realized early on that we had to understand the mechanics of musculoskeletal systems and the properties of the sensors that, that provide that, particularly proprioceptors. And we had set up a very extensive software system for modeling complex musculoskeletal systems and their properties. This is the musculoskeletal modeling software that I worked for about 10 years with Ramon Davuti. And it uh, and we had developed it with the notion of using it to fit functional neuromuscular stimulation systems that were trying to actually produce functional movements. And we had set it up so that it had interfaces with mechanical devices like prosthetic limbs and sockets and things like that. You could import SolidWorks shapes and incorporate their mechanics into the mechanics of the plant. Uh, so when DARPA decided to fund a major effort to improve prosthetic hands, prosthetic arms for amputees, you know, as a result of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, right. uh, we were asked uh, to be one of about a dozen different groups that they brought together in this DARPA program to produce a next generation uh, prosthesis. And we were asked to do the control and systems modeling. So it's our expertise. And then there were groups there who knew about batteries and motors and sockets. And, and so they had realized correctly that it was essential to have tactile feedback. And they had uh, a couple of groups that you know, were representing that. So I was at the kickoff meeting uh, where they brought all the groups together and some external consultants. And I was sitting next to Roland Johansson, one of oh. the consultants on tactile sensing. And the groups that were going to provide the tactile sensors for this very aggressive, very expensive four-year blitz development presented the technologies they thought would make for good tactile sensors. And I looked at Roland and Roland looked at me and said, these guys are nuts. <laughs> None of these technologies measures what you need to measure in a finger. They all assumed that touch was sort of taxels, you know, normal force right. sensing arrays. And they were all sensing technologies that involved, you know, little cantilevers of MEMS and little gold wire leads and, you know, things that wouldn't survive, you know, five minutes in a real environment like washing dishes. Right. So, you know, we we were sitting in the bar afterwards getting drunk and commiserating about having signed on with such a bunch of fools. <laughs> And I said, well, so Roland, you know, let's talk about how tactile sensing and skin really works. And he started mentioning and I started thinking and we started sketching literally on a cocktail napkin. And we came up with the idea for what is now the biotech, a tactile sensor that senses the deformation of the skin without having to have active electronics or any leads at all in the skin. Because, you know, the skin's going to wear out and have to mm -hmm. be replaced. It's kind of a no brainer. 
And we came up with the technology of, of the biotech. In fact, uh, we started to realize this might be a useful invention. And we actually had the, the cocktail napkin witnessed by the guy at the next table who was the FDA representative. <laughs> oh, those, those are good bars to hang out. So, so I took the design back to my lab and, you know, and secured a small amount of money from the National Academies of Science has this Keck Futures Initiative program to develop a very crude prototype. And it worked really well. It looked ugly as hell, but it really worked. And so we said, oh, this is great. So now we need to get some proper funding to do a decent version of this. And right. so I went to you know program managers at NIH, at NSF, and said, you know, we'd like to see about you know, what kind of a grant we could get to fund this. And they said, no, you're never going to get a grant for that because if you've already worked out the technology, it's not exotic. You know, I think it was clever, but it is stuff you could build literally with stuff off the shelf. Yeah. You already have the idea. You know, it's not a research program. You know, it's not academic research, but it would be perfect for an SBIR. And I said, well, what's an SBIR? Oh, that's a small business innovative research grant. Well, yeah, but to get an SBIR, you have to have an SB, <laughs> a small business. Yeah. And I'm a professor with a bunch of graduate students. And I said, oh, well, okay. So I came back home and I talked to my graduate students and I said, okay, guys, uh, we have to form a small business because that's how we'll get funded. And we formed Syntouch. <laughs> and we said, okay, look, we could use this technology for prosthetic arms. You know, that's going to interest NIH, and we could use this to fund, you know, robots for right. sensing technologies. That's going to be involved NSF, and you know, we could use this to uh, locate IEDs and and search bags and protect the military. So we could get, you know, that'd be of interest to uh, DoD and DARPA, and we could use this to pick fruit. Yeah. You know, you have to have tactile right, sensing right. and an automated fruit picker. Characterized uh, textures. That'd be interesting to the Department of, Ag yeah, Department of Agriculture. So we basically took the same technology. We applied for four phase one SBIR grants, which are tiny amounts of money for like six months. Not enough to fund a business on individually, but we got all four SBIR grants. And that's how we funded Synthage. Oh, well, that's a good reason for funding a company. I mean, we... We had no alternative. I always tell my students... It's really the last thing you want to do if you're in academic research because it is a huge distraction. Right. But if you have to do it, you can do it. Yeah, I guess, you know, it. we do that in a lesser degree by adapting our grants proposal to whoever is funding them, right? <laughs> so fun, different funding agencies, they have a different priorities and then you have to adapt a little bit. And in this case, um, we have a similar situation in Sweden when one of the agencies that's it's called Vinova, they finance mostly translational research that is linked to industry and so on. And, and therefore, we have to think about, well, do you have a company to work on this? Have we create a company? And some of those grants are, are relatively good. And it's mostly because of that problem, right? Because once it looks more like a technology development than, than research, then it's harder to get funded via the conventional means of research. So that started... I don't know if you still have the, the headquarters or the offices in the same place. Was it downtown LA, if I remember correctly? Are you still there? They moved up to the north end of the city. It's in Montrose now. Okay. Uh, and it's going well. I mean, the sensors look great. So it is a success to the extent that, like, unlike most startup businesses in technology, it hasn't failed yet. Which is good. <laughs> <laughs> We're still alive. And it's been 12 years now. Oh, 12 years. Um, wow, yeah, that's been some yeah, time, yeah. We, we started in 2008. On the other hand, it hasn't taken off yet. Uh, our original, so, of course, we originally developed this for prosthetic hands. Right. We knew from the get-go that that was not going to be a viable commercial market. Because it's too small. Or... Um, it's too small, it's too cost-sensitive. The technology is going to add a lot of complexity. And the, re the reimbursement for these kinds of rehabilitation products is just miserable in the U.S. and, and increasingly right. in much of the world. Uh, so we thought, well, okay, this is going to be used for autonomous robots. You know, people were talking about robots that would work around the house or in the hospital, handling patients or cleaning, you know, doing the dishes. And these are all things that you cannot do without tactile sensing. And so we started making and still do make these sensors for robotics researchers, both in academia and in industry. 
But you notice there aren't yet any autonomous robots with manipulation capabilities. Right. So we're you know when you sell small numbers of sensors to researchers, it's you know it's a rather painful business. Right. Spend a lot of time hand holding graduate students and answering questions and dealing with you know we wanted a little different and. You know, give us a quote, but we won't know for a year whether or not we have a grant right, right. and that kind of stuff. A lot of technical support. A lot of technical support. It's just, you know, why the sensors, which we we knew from the beginning, could be manufactured very cheaply, mm -hmm. are very expensive. Our biggest cost is not our parts and, and, and assembly. It's what you call cost of sales. Okay. Yeah. Getting the sales and supporting the users right. to make it possible for them to use. Uh, so the company exists, but then, you know, Jeremy and I published his thesis research, Jeremy Fischel, on the ability of the sensors to discriminate textures. And within two weeks of that rather uh, obscure paper appearing, uh, we started getting calls from people like Procter & Gamble. Right. Why do they care? Well, they sell personal care products. And, uh, you know, we were literally telling, talking to the people who sell Charmin toilet paper. <laughs> I don't know if they have that in, in Sweden, but for the last 40 years, Charmin toilet paper is the premium toilet paper, and it's sold on the basis of how it feels. Right. So they make this stuff all over the world. They're constantly having to change their materials and, and fabrication methods, and they're selling it on how it feels. How do they know? It, they literally have panels of people who come in and feel different samples of toilet paper or cosmetic products, or you know, wipes, or mm -hmm. whatever it is, and say, yeah, I like it, no, I don't. And this is very noisy and very expensive. So they were thrilled at the idea of a machine that could actually give them objective measurements relatable to what the thing would feel like to a human finger. Right. So we've been developing the business completely different from the sensors. We now have a specialized instrument that makes these poking and stroking movements. Characterization of the texture, right? So that were the characterize all kinds of materials, not and textures where we started, but but you know, compliance, thermal uh -huh. properties, all things that are enormously important. Automobile right. in, in interiors, for instance, where subliminally you decide this is quality or not. And on the basis of something like the finish of the seat upholstery or the dashboard, right. you decide whether or not to spend fifty thousand dollars on a car. Now this drives the automakers crazy. How do they? Yeah. You know, they want a bean count, get the cheapest possible right, materials, right. and you know, somebody says, "Yeah, it feels just as good." Well, how do they know? Mm -hmm. So you brought the science, a systematic process so, to characterizing the, those features. So we're doing that um, again. It's a slow process. Right. You have to convince people that you have a solution to a problem that they really didn't understand they had and that is completely different from the way they're dealing with it now. Right, right. So and what is your view of this? Because you, you have gone through all these different aspects of basic science and translational research and entrepreneurship. And sometimes people have different views between the relationship that there should be between academy and industry, particularly between, say, medicine and industry with all the conflict of interest and so on. I understand the setup in the U.S. Is it helpful to start a company? Do they, do they see it as a good thing that you have certain idea and you say, well, we spin off a company to make it happen? Or is it seen more like you kind of betraying the, the hard academics because now you're mixed with industry? So when I first started applying for patents back in the 80s, it was a huge no-no amongst academic researchers. I mean, you know, government paid for the research. It should be free to the public. What are you doing? Uh, when I teach intellectual property law now to my engineering and science students, nobody asks that question anymore. Right. Everybody gets it that a company isn't going to spend a billion dollars developing a new drug, you know, unless they can get, you know, at least a decade's worth of exclusive ability to charge what they need to recoup their investment. Right. And you know, particularly with drugs, you know, the the pill might cost a dollar a piece to make and they have to sell it for a thousand dollars. So obviously if they have no patent protection, as soon as it's approved, somebody's going to have a me too generic product and they're screwed. Right. And to a lesser extent, this is a problem in any uh, medical device that's novel and requires a large upfront investment. 
So everybody gets that. Uh, getting more involved than just the patent in the business is something that I've wrestled with uh, and wondered, you know, would I start getting uh, questionable glances from my colleagues and my academic uh, administration? Uh, fortunately, now I'm in an engineering school that understands that it's really important, particularly for engineers, to have contacts with industry. It's how you keep current with your own technology and your teaching. It's how you develop networks that lead to improving what you teach and providing job opportunities for your graduates. Right, right. Uh, University of Southern California is a, a fairly exclusive private university that charges an outrageous amount of money for tuition. And it essentially justifies that by saying, you're gonna to get to work with people who have you know, they're, they're leaders in academia with strong contacts with industry who can, you know, advance your career. So I think the university sees this and, you know, the occasional publicity that helps to, you know, from our successes. Right, that, right. Uh, to bring more students. Provides the cachet that helps them sell their product. Right. Which is tuition. Right. Yeah, so they're positive um, about it. I think being in a public inter university would probably be a little more problematic because they don't have quite the same tuition generating model. And they're a lot more concerned about government oversight. You know, some pol politician trying to make points by finding some malfeasance. Some sure, 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 sure. Yeah. <laughs> In Sweden, it's a very unique situation. Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but it's one of the few countries where you as an academic, any IP you develop belongs to you. Which is, you know, it sounds great at the same time. Well, universities try to help you to commercialize those ideas, but it is not as streamlined or professionalized as it is in the U.S. where the universities own part of it. So it's on their interest to make sure that, you know, the IP is set up correctly and, and there's a good commercialization. Well, if you take a look at one of the essays in the uh, manuscript, you're saying it, um, it talks about the problems that we have in the U.S. with the academic bureaucracy for tech transfer that arose when the U.S. made this fateful decision in 1980, 40 years ago, called the Bayh-Dole Act. And the Bayh-Dole Act said that, uh, that the uh, intellectual property developed under any federal grant or contract to a university or a company uh, would be essentially owned by and needed to be developed by university uh, or, or by, by the institutional owner. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was certainly an improvement over trying to let the government handle it, which is the way it was before. Uh, but it gave rise to bureaucracies in most universities that essentially have a monopoly and don't really understand uh, most of the technology. I mean, how could they? Their scope of things the university deals with are, are huge um, and doesn't really have the connections with industry. Now, in 1980, academics really didn't know much about commercialization themselves individually. You know, there are still people who thought that patents were a bad idea. And now, of course, most people in both the School of Medicine or School of Engineering really understand how the games play, often a lot better than the folks who get in the technology transfer mm -hmm. office. I mean, in addition to them having to be generalists dealing with the whole range of university stuff. The truth is that if you know what you're doing in technology development and intellectual property, you don't take a job working for a university, you work for a startup. Mm -hmm. That's where the money and the chance right, to right, be right, profitable right. are. You know, if you're not very good, you wind up in the university, you know, pretending to manage extremely sophisticated IP and it doesn't work very well. So I've advocated for what they have actually in the US also at the University of Wisconsin, uh, a system where you get you are presumed to be the owner. You can keep the rights if you know what you want to do with it. And you're willing to take care of it and fund it yourself or get a company to do it. Then it's on you. Go ahead and do it. But if you realize it's a huge distraction, you don't know what you're doing, you don't have the money or whatever, you can offer it to the university, mm -hmm. negotiate with them. And then they take over the management of the intellectual property and share some of the returns with you. Right. And I think that's what we need, a much more flexible system where there isn't an inherent monopoly. Monopoly is corrupt. Yeah, there's always this um, 
unintended consequence. So people try to regulate it and often, or you hope that they have the best intentions when they're doing it, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. Well, they had the best intentions when they started, but uh, things change. You, people respond to whatever the rules are, and they have to be constantly tweaked to deal with evolution. Right. Correct. So if you don't mind, I would like to pick your brain a little bit on this part, since now I understood that you're teaching IP. In your experience, can you talk about how you go about saying like, okay, so we have this idea, um, and there is, I assume there is some patents related to, to the sensor. And... And then you have to make sure you don't talk much about it before you file your patent or, or with certain restrictions. And if, if you just, you know, if, if there are students listening to this, that, and I'm teaching a course right now called Development of Medical Devices, where we try to teach this, but I think it will be nice to hear it from, from the way you've done it for, for this case, for example. So... It is absolutely true that you have to be very careful of what's called bar dates. Any public disclosure, use, going to a scientific meeting, writing a journal article, even demonstrating uh, something, uh, is effectively eliminates your ability to secure a patent. It makes the invention public domain. And if the public already knows about it, it is no longer novel when you apply to the patent office. So even though it was your own invention, you screwed up and that's the end of that. And so this is one of the problems with uh, the notion that you have to secure intellectual property and, and when you're in an academic environment and people, students need to publish and give talks because that's what their careers depend on. So how do we reconcile that? So filing a full patent application is a long and expensive process. But there is something in the U.S. called a provisional patent application. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so the scenario I always tell my students is, and this happens all the time, suppose you are planning to give a talk at a meeting and you're putting your slides together and you're going to take off in two days and you realize, oh, there's something patentable here. I hadn't even thought about that before. I'm going to talk about this. I've committed to it. Uh, but there's no protection for this intellectual property. What do I do now? I certainly don't have the time to write a patent application, but I can take whatever I've got. It's my abstract, my slides, my notes, my hand-drawn sketches, my notebook, whatever I've got, I can bundle together in something called a provisional patent application. I mean, it's a mess but it will never be reviewed by the examiner. All it does is it puts a, a flag in the ground and says, this is what I knew as of this date. Right. And anything in here, I now have one year to actually decide to turn into a utility mm -hmm. patent application. If I do that now, I've secured that because the priority date for the utility application will be the date of the provisional. Right. And if anybody hears about it or even invents it afterwards, I have established legal priority, the priority right. date through the provisional. Now, if I wait and I don't file in exactly one year or less, then it's as if it never happened. So the material I submitted is never reviewed. It essentially goes away. Uh, it's if I haven't in the interim actually disclosed it publicly, I could go ahead and file another provisional or a full utility application. Uh, of course, if I have disclosed it and I've waited a year, now uh, I've lost the opportunity to capture that priority date. Uh, so that's what I tell people to do. And I think once, you know, people always worry in our business about having their ideas stolen. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, the problem is mostly having your ideas ignored. <laughs> In fact, if you're an academic and you want to become famous rather than an industrialist who wants to become rich, then the best thing to do is to have your ideas stolen. So somebody else takes all the trouble of making it into a product and the risk and finance of commercializing it and marketing it. And then when it's out there and everybody's using it and you've published the paper that introduced it, you're thrilled that somebody stole the idea and turned it into success because now you're famous. And if nobody does, it's just another paper that nobody reads. 
So, uh, if but but the, but the provisional even gives you you know more protection because essentially you're in a position now to say, especially during that uh, that year before you file the right. utility, you might go and approach an industrial partner and say, you know, are you interested in this? I have this provisional. I don't have the time or resources mm-hmm. to develop it, but now you've got something you could acquire. So my what I tell my students is. As soon as you come up with an idea, and you can file a provisional, you know, from your bedroom on your computer for like a couple hundred bucks. You just, it's all electronic. And now you're protected. Now, if you want to go talk to a company, they, and, you know, you don't have to worry about them stealing right, your idea because right, right. you've got this provisional. Right, right. And you can go ahead and give your talk at the meeting and, you know, you're fine. You don't have to wait till you file. A, a full utility pad. Right. That sounds like a great tool. I'm not sure we have that in Sweden. I'll, I'll have to double check. Well, you can apply for it in the U.S. You know, so right. one of the things we have is the Patent Cooperation Treaty. So once you filed in any jurisdiction with any mechanism that that jurisdiction allows, you now have the opportunity to secure patent protection in all the members of the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is basically all the right, members right, right. on the planet. So... You know, if your country doesn't have a provisional, I don't know if the European system as a, as a, in general has it, file a U.S. provisional, convert it to a U.S. utility patent, file the, the what's, you know, the, the PTO, uh, you know, international yeah, yeah. applications, and, you know, it eventually takes care of itself. Yeah. So it's just a little bit of anticipation it's you can make the best of the system. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip uh, for people listening that don't live in the U.S. They can still apply for a for a provisional in the U.S. That's a good thing to know. Thanks, thanks a lot for that. So going back a little bit to the science, you have worked within the biomedical engineering field, which is very broad, and there's a lot of different applications and at a certain level, different technologies. How do you decide when it's time to move on? <laughs> Ah, yes. As I tell folks, I have a short attention span. I can't keep <laughs> doing the same thing for more than five or ten years. Well, it's not so short. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, the truth is, it, it takes about five or ten years to get any novel thing to fruition. Now, nothing is ever done. My feeling is that after five or ten years, you know, it, it's either going to work or not. And if it's science, you've probably gotten a large part of the benefit of a new method, right. or a new experimental design. Um, and you could keep working on it because, you know, every journal article always ends with more study is needed about this problem. Right. And you could be the person who does more study about this problem or you can move on to something else. Now, I find it you know, exciting to do that. Uh, it's risky, of course. Once you become known in a field, you've been publishing for five or 10 years, and everybody, you know, you send in your grant right. proposals, they say, oh, yeah, this guy's doing good work, we'll give him more money. You send in your journal articles, and the reviewers say, oh, yeah, we know this guy's okay. Yeah. You decide to work in some new field. It doesn't matter how good your credentials are in the old field, <laughs> you're the new kid on the block. Right. You know, you send in your grant, and they say, who the hell is this clown? You know, he doesn't seem to know who the players are. He hasn't referenced the right pep, the right, right papers, right. especially the you know the reviewers. Right, papers. right, right. <laughs> Fatal mistake. So yeah, it's and you know you have a going lab. You've got students you have to support. You've got all the equipment that does the one thing you've been doing. Yeah, moving into a new field is a, is a huge distraction, huge risk. I think it's the way to keep your brain going and to learn new things. And often the things that you work on next, you realize have connections to things you were working on before in ways that are synergistic. And once you put together things that, that, that nobody's really seen connections to before. So you know, that's a large part of what we've been doing lately with our, the results coming out of the algorithm we developed for the tactile texture discrimination, which may actually be a general uh, way in which the brain organizes the relationship between action and perception. Uh, so, so I, I think it's important to do it. It's important to take those risks. I hope it keeps my brain young. They say <laughs> that learning new things does that. Uh, helps to avoid the decay of aging. 
Yeah, it's certainly difficult. Um, and I think it's the same, not only in academy, but in industry, right? If you start working in a certain position, even in a certain field, and then yeah. you, you earn a certain amount of money. And then if you decide to change, it's a little bit harder because changing job, you don't have experience in the new thing. But I think there is... Been a- so students often ask the difference between academia and industry, because most of my engineering students, my doctoral students in particular, have, have wound up actually in industry rather than academia. What's the difference? And you know, they're almost completely inverse. So in academia, you get a job that comes with a salary and a tin cup. They don't actually pay you to do what you're supposed to be doing. Right. You've got to go out and find the money. And if you don't, if you have a tenure, they continue to pay you, but you're kind of dead wood. And which is is really terribly inefficient because having an expensive, well trained person and letting them sit there twiddle their fingers because they haven't been able to fill their tin cup is kind of stupid for the institution. But that's the way science works in academia. The good news is, of course, that you can, within the same job, decide to work on anything you want. If you can fill the tin cup with something right, new, okay. everybody's happy. I don't have to move. I just you know, I have to transform my lab, get different students mm-hmm. and different equipment. Mm-hmm. But OK, I can do that. Industry is exactly the reverse. You get a job in industry. They're going to give you all the resources to do the job they hired you for. And they're going to tell you what that job right. is. And you better do it. <laughs> you can't say, this isn't so interesting anymore. I want to work on something else. Because they're going to say, no, this is what we need to keep our products and markets flowing. And we don't care what you want to work on. So, yes, if you want to change in industry, you know, it isn't just deciding what you want to work on. It's finding another place that wants you to work on that. And the closer you get to the cutting edge, the less interested industries are on funding that kind of stuff. I mean, I just told you a whole bunch of stories about how stuff on the cutting edge, which looks wonderful technically and clinically, never got to be marketed products. Now, you know, I, that was grant money, but if it was a company that, was paying my salary and funding all that research, and there was no return on investment, they'd be in trouble. Yeah. And so would yeah, I. Someone would get fired, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's at best. Yeah. You know, what happens in companies that don't make yeah, money they, is they go they bankrupt. bankrupt right. <laughs> no, and I was actually talking with you know some people working in these big medical device companies, and some of them have openly said, you know, the next breakthroughs are not going to come from us because it's too risky. So big established companies, is just too risky to go into, a, say, a new technology or something that might have the liability might be too great and so on. It's needed for startups or people that take the risk, show that it's possible, prove it clinically. And then, you know, the big companies might say, okay, that works and we can buy that technology. And um, But it seems to be an impediment for big industry to do that in the medical device, at least, because there's a lot of liabilities attached to it. And, you know, I think we may be in, ready for a major shift, um, actually away from the technology I'm comfortable with. Uh, I think we probably pushed the electrical interface technology you know, close to as far as it's going to go. Right. Uh, attempts to get finer grain uh, interfaces with chronic microelectrode interfaces, you know, are looking really hard and maybe not possible at all, or at least practical clinic. And you know, recognize that the microelectrode, implantable electronics for animals, starting with the pacemaker in clinics in the 60s, um, that was the hot technology when I was a student. And it led to things like cochlear implant, deep brain stimulation, and spinal cord stimulation, all of which are essentially highly modified pacemakers. Right. Titanium package with a bunch of with a lead with funny looking electrodes on the end. Few contacts. Doing macro enterprises. Right. And we push that about as far as we can, can go. And the alternatives are looking dicey. And we understand the biophysics of what it will take. And it's really hard. Right. So the hot new field that looks to me like microelectrodes looked to me when I was a student back in, in the 60s is optogenetics. Right you know, stop sticking wires Mm -hmm. and stuff and shine light on or get light out of. Right. And 
you know, of course, now not only do you have to have the technology to do that and all the information about what you're doing with the signals, but you have to do this little bit of genetic engineering right. and getting that done in humans is going to be a huge obstacle, but not insurmountable. Mm-hmm. And if you're a student, you know, you need to think about what's going to be feasible and hot, not now, but 10 years from now. And certainly not what was feasible and hot 20 years ago, because that's been played out. Right, right. So, you know, I think optical techniques, optogenetics, and, you know, various ways of both monitoring and modulating neurons uh, with light are going to open up a whole new range of applications. Right. Uh, A lot of them will fail, just as the electrical (laughs) interfaces did, and some of them will be spectacular successes. Right. And, you know, it seems like a frontier worth exploring if you've got the rest of your career ahead. Right, right. No, I totally agree with you. I think... um, optogenetics or sonogenetics, any way that you can more selectively stimulate fibers and receive information, it's the next thing because of this fundamental problem. And this opinion hasn't been very popular with my colleagues in in the field of neural interfaces. But I see a fundamental problem with electrical stimulation because, I mean, when you send an electric pulse, that radiates, right? So it's hard to be selective in the fibers. Um, unless you have these small electrodes. But when you start having these small electrodes, then you have all the problems with the uh, encapsulation and the longevity of those electrodes. And we were discussing before how the issue with the visual prosthesis is that you need certain resolution. And in the field closer to me, that's prosthetics, there's been a lot of talk about touch and restoring touch and the naturalness of how natural the sensations are perceived. And the issue there, again, is resolution. And that's what I've been trying to say in a few papers, because there, there seems to be some groups in the field that have the, or, or certainly they write it in the papers as if having 100 electrodes or 20 something or 30 electrodes will restore natural touch. But I- even if you have those points, you're still not selectively stimulating the fibers in the same way that, that the intact biological system will do. And therefore it will be, it will be hard that it's perceived as natural touch of an intact arm. That's different than being useful, right? So you can have useful sensation, and that's probably what we're going to be focusing in the coming year. So how do we provide some sensations that are intuitive for the patient, that are useful for utilizing the prosthesis, but taking that into a natural sensation as restoring a human hand, the human experience of touch, it's very complicated, not only for because of the neural interface, but the other thing you mentioned uh, that is not very sexy to talk about or not many people is interested, but the connectors are such a pain. When you have hundreds of wires, then you need your silk case and hundreds of free throughs. And so how you do that, that's what I've seen that I've you know, been developing these interfaces that are fully implanted. That's where we had the, the biggest headache. So, so when I designed you know, the thing and I'm testing all the stuff, the failures that I didn't expect that now, you know, in hindsight, I should have known were in the connectors. So, so the issues were the connectors. But, uh, but I think we can still, you know, provide useful sensory feedback and touch in these systems. So there is maybe a bit more to be gained there. But more than that, I think it will require a, a radically new technology uh, such as optogenetics or sonogenetics or something else that we haven't hear about yet. So one way you need to, I, I think for getting a technology into commercial and clinical use, there has to be a bootstrapping strategy. You, know, you might want eventually to produce you know, natural manipulation of objects. But as you say, we're not even close to that. And if you can find a clinical application or in which a very modest, low resolution tactile addition provides a benefit that is, you know, where the risk benefit or the cost benefit is favorable, because the technology now can be kept simple and reliable, uh, then you have a way to start getting acceptance and developing both a reputation for something that looks promising and companies that are that have the cash flow to fund the further development of eventually getting to the sophisticated devices. So, you know, the first 
cochlear implant that was actually commercially successful was a device that a uh, surgeon here in Los Angeles, Bill House, convinced a company called 3M, a small one, the the big 3M, uh, to to build a single channel cochlear right. implant. You know, it was like the worst possible design for a cochlear implant. And it was clear that in about 3,000 patients who received this device, they will, you know, it has zero spectral resolution. So there's no way they're going to understand words with this thing. But it turned out to be actually quite useful to as an aid to, uh, to speech reading, you know, lip reading, as a way to recognize environmental sounds, like is that a doorbell or a siren, because they have temporal modulation or to even adjust the loudness of your own voice, which if you're 100% deaf, is a serious problem. And so this device is what got the world to pay attention to multi-channel cochlear implants that then took 20 years to actually become right, successful. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a great story. And, and it's, it's actually something I tell to some of my funding agencies. And when we give classes, they're like, well, if we have one to three locations, that's better than nothing. It still is, is nowhere close a human hand, but it shows that the concept, it's beneficial for the patient. So our patients, they have a sensor in the thumb and they can tell when they make contact with an object and approximately how much force they're putting on it. That's better than not having any of that information. Is it close to a human hand? Absolutely not, but it's still functional. So that opens the door for things to be improved um, further on. You know, we published a paper showing that if you had the tactile sensor, you didn't even need the neural interface. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that. Paper. It makes a regulation of the amplitude of the EMG signal to, to make it yeah. proportional. It's right. basically an inhibitory reflex. You just build it into the controller of the conversion of the yeah. myoelectric signal to the so, motors. And it produces a huge advantage in manipulation of objects. And even a, it isn't conscious touch, but you have the sense that you're aware of the environment and the prosthesis is behaving intelligently. And if you think about it, you know, the brain actually works that way. A lot of the tactile information that modulates the way your muscles work is not conscious. Right, right, right. You, you know, your brain, you know, has the sense that it, that it's dealing with an intelligently controlled hand, rather than having to think about it each muscle constantly, to consciously. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I think it'd be great to add the tactile perception consciously. But it may not be necessary, at least for the low-level function that you know might right. get this thing moving forward. I think the way you did it was very smart because you know, independent actuation. So integrating sensory feedback without the human in the loop has been tried before. So so you're familiar with the autobot hand, the sensor hand. It has sensors, and then when it detects a slippage, the hand closes itself and yes. patients don't like it because if it doesn't work perfectly, then the patients don't, don't appreciate the hand doing the stuff without them being in control. But the way you did it, if I remember correctly, is that a strength of the contraction and that's tuned down based on the force that is applied. So the person is still on the loop applying certain force, uh, but the hand is taking the decision of how much it let that pass through. So the human is still on the control system but getting assistance from the from from an intelligence within the hand. Yep, I mean it's it's really the the opposite control loop. I mean they're talking about a positive right. control loop in which tactile sense leads to increased force. Well, that's of course a runaway control loop because what as soon as you squeeze right, harder, right. you get more tactile input. The tactile input says, "Oh, that's a squeeze." You know, it doesn't know the difference between a squeeze and a slip. So it says, "I need to grip even harder." So yeah, of course patients don't like this. And we don't have a good solution for that. Slip detection is a really hard problem. So if you haven't got a solution for a hard problem, <laughs> you know, try to find an easier problem that's still useful. And handling fragile objects, you know, and the example, you know, we like to show is, and it's in a video from, uh, from, from a news coverage that we had, is the problem of opening one of those little, very flexible right. plastic water bottles, right? You got to grip the bottle tightly enough with one hand and off, unscrew the top with the other. And you know that if you grip too tightly, as soon as you sure, unscrew sure. the top, you're going to get a water fountain because you're going to crush the bottle. So, you know, how do you keep that from happening? And this was the perfect solution for that. Yeah, modulating the force at the, at the interface. Yeah, it automatically goes to and sets a grip that's not going to crush the object. So 
one more thing I, I wanted to to ask you about. What's your view on PhDs and why would somebody do a PhD or not? I, it probably changed a little bit from the time you did yours to the way that is now done. So I don't actually have a PhD. My only legitimate degree is an MD. Um, I know the fashion now is for people to do MD PhDs. The question is, what what is the PhD giving you? I didn't feel it was necessary to get a PhD because as a result of my active work in research as an undergraduate and all through medical school, I was a terrible medical student. <laughs> Never wanted me to be your doctor. Uh, I spent so much time doing research. Uh, I got the equivalent, I hope, of exposure to how to, to take on a really large problem and how to do scholarly research, to review the literature, to understand what's been done before, to formulate a plan, design and execute experiments, process and interpret data, and write up you know, a lengthy you know, report. And that's what a PhD teaches you, you know, how to take on a really big problem. It's the only thing that does. It's the reason why in the past, industry didn't understand why it would ever want anybody with a PhD because they're so highly right. trained in something so narrow that there's not a chance they're going to ever use their thesis in their industrial research. So why bother having, hiring somebody who's expensive and highfalutin and high maintenance? And the reason is that's the only people who actually go through this exercise of taking on a really big problem and learning how to solve it rigorously. That's what it gives you. Forget right. the thesis topic. It's the process. That's what you're learning. And that's something that will be with you the rest of your life. If you can get that experience any other way, you don't need a PhD, but it's increasingly true because you know, in academia, there's right. not a chance you're going to do research without it a doctorate of some sort, MD or PhD. And industry has come to recognize that the people who are well enough trained and selected to be smart enough to get a PhD are the people they need to lead the kinds of large research and development projects mm -hmm. that industry now tackles. 50 years ago, industry did rather derivative stuff. It really didn't have any significant right. in-house research of such. It just did modest engineering development. So it didn't need, you know, PhDs, but you know, cutting edge industries now have real research departments. They're often doing research that's often more rigorous and better, certainly better funded than what you can do in academia. And they need people who know how to take on those big projects. Yeah. So the scope of what industry did in the past to what they do now has changed. And that's why you see, you know, in the past you had to make this decision pretty much right out of school. Am I going, you know, let's say you have your PhD. Now you're going to decide I'm going to go into academia. Or I'm going to go into industry. And once I make that decision, it's forever. That's the way it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now you see people going back and forth. You see people in academia who wind up, you know, taking a job in industry. You see people who spent most of their careers in industry, but managed to keep up a publication record who get appointed to faculty. And I think that's very healthy. Right. And it means that you don't have to make such a, fateful decision at such a right. it's not the end of the world if you decide to go uh, either way although it might still yeah. be a little bit more difficult if you go into industry and then want to go back to academy because of this problem of lacking publications to get grants which is kind of yeah. needed in academy so yeah i mean you get a phd you are qualified to get a job in an industry right. where people publish and have patents and things like that but not necessarily that will be your job you find yourself in, in an industry that has you, you know, doing you know, rather mundane things or has ultra top secrecy and never lets you publish anything or go to international meetings, then, yeah, you will not have the credentials you need to be recognized in academia. Right. So to wrap up, I would really like to touch on the book that you're writing, and I really appreciate that you share a draft with me. I found rather interesting the variety and range of topics that you are touching upon in the book. So I guess the natural question is, what took you to write such a book? Well, I had gradually collected a bunch of essays. I find, you know, when I think about something, you know, I, I like to write it down, mostly for my own amusement or to exchange with a couple of friends that we've had a discussion about. And they sort of turn into these analyses, which, you know, I found useful. And I started realizing that you know, they, they might be linkable in some useful way with a central theme. I'm still working on that. 
Uh, not sure I've come up with a sufficiently coherent one to be of, of interest, but uh, it's it's been a, a way to keep track of, of you know, thoughts on a wide range of topics that I've come up with. And, uh, but I think it's a good strategic move to make that disclaimer in the beginning, saying like, well, so this is what it is. So, the, so there are a lot of ideas <laughs> and they, they kind of put together, but it's, a, it's not a full-built puzzle. Uh, but yet there are some interesting things here and there. And I I found interesting you talk about mathematics and logic and science and culture as machines that we created, not necessarily only the, the hardware of physical objects we're used to seeing machines. So machine has a Greek derivation that really refers to all kinds of constructs. It doesn't have to mean mechanical constructs, we use it that way, but all of the things that humans have developed that are not found in nature. I mean, they might be descriptions of nature, but they're metaphorical descriptions. They aren't nature. They're ways to organize our thoughts about nature, and mathematics is certainly in that category. You know, and, and if you think about it, cultures are just large versions of that. You know, they're machines. They're sets of rules and mechanisms that allow societies to develop and to compete. And they have this enormous amount of variety, just as right. the mechanical machines of life have this enormous amount of variety. Um, and, and they are all products that are devised by humans for the advancement of humans. Um, and, and that's really how I started thinking about right weaving them all together. I, I thought it was interesting from the viewpoint of, of course, working on neuroprosthesis, there is always this separation between man and machine and what's biological and what's artificial. And I feel like, and even myself, I had this romantic view of what is it to be human or the the, the entirety of a, of a human body. But after... I think after going into science and trying to understand more how things work and so on, it's, it's unavoidable to see a lot of the biological processes, you know, as machines in a way, but not so particularly divine, but just processes that work. And and I think that's um, um, it. It's a useful concept from the viewpoint that when if we think about replacing body parts that have been lost due to injury, um, we try to replace a bodily function with these artificial parts and that doesn't necessarily make you less human because at the end you know you can say your body is a machine i, I think it's it's useful to keep the distinction uh this your body is something that's found in nature and we do not actually understand much of how it works we have these constructs our theories our metaphors for that interpret the way it behaves as if it were a machine that right. we already understand. Uh, but it is, you know, that's not true. It's, it's just some sort of an approximation. And I think we, we do that so that we can replace or augment functions uh, using machines, and we're getting increasingly good at it. But I think it's important to recognize that our machine-like interpretation of the body is inevitably flawed and inadequate. And that's why things don't always turn out well, as it, we expect. Well, wouldn't you say that is, or or the way I see it is, it's a limitation of our of language and our ability to this make a description of what we have limited understanding of. So if we talk about the way the body works, you can say, well, you know, we talk about it as a machine because we have maybe a bit more experience with mechanical machines and then you can make that analogy. Um, but then you could argue that it is possible that at some point we're going to fully understand and there are some systems that we understand more thoroughly that you can say, well, you could in principle tell every step that's happening uh, for the creation of energy or for the transfer of this molecule to here and there or the homeostasis kept in the body and things like that, at which point um, it will be more accurate to say, well, it's a biological machine, or, or is it really needed to specify that it's a biological machine versus a, a man-made 
machine. The most we can hope for is to get to theories and metaphors that are fit for purpose, for limited purposes. We will, you know, I mean, it, it's theoretically possible, I suppose, that we have, in fact, complete knowledge of how something works, but we can never be sure of that. Sure. We don't know what we don't know. And do you remember around 1900, the great physicists of the world We're had done. said, well, <laughs> physics is pretty much done. You know, we've got Newton's laws. We've measured all the constants to X number of decimal places. It's going to be pretty boring from here on out. And then this fellow called Albert Einstein, you know, knocked around in the patent office and came up with some new ideas. And physics exploded. So, you know, we can look at any part of science, whether it's biological or physical or chemical or anything else, and say, we have a really good handle on this and we can do a lot of really important stuff. So we're done. Sure. But we're not. And we certainly don't, we certainly can't be sure. So I agree done. with that. I guess my comment were more related to if you see your hand as a very sophisticated machine, you can remove a little bit the romanticism to it and and potentially eliminate even some of the prejudice around not having a hand and using a prosthetic hand instead, right? And then you can make the argument, well, you know, the hand is a, it's a machine and then you put another machine and, uh, and this machine is not as good as the other machine, but it kind of does the job. So the world as, so, as a society, at least in the West, has gotten much better at accepting right. mechanical prostheses and mechanic, you know, essentially turning people into cyborgs. Uh, when I first started, one of the big problems with any kind of prosthetic technology, whether it was cochlear implant or an artificial leg, is there was this huge emphasis on making it invisible. So you didn't look like a cyborg. You didn't look like a freak because people had no tolerance for that kind of thing. And no matter how hard you do that, it never succeeds. You know, it always looks like a right. badly painted prosthesis and it doesn't quite right. match the skin tone and doesn't, you know, it's just not there. And one of the things that's made the field of prosthetic legs advance right. usually is nobody gives a damn anymore. You know, they show off their legs. They walk around in short pants with all the mechatronics showing because it's really cool. You know, when we had to build cochlear implants, you know, the emphasis was to make the little earpiece that attaches magnetically mm -hmm. above and behind the ear invisible. So, you know, you'd make it this, this flesh tone or something, <laughs> which, of course, stood out like a sore thumb on anybody. And when we started putting them in pediatric patients, you know, maybe 20 uh, years ago, uh, the patients looked at that and said, that's ugly. I want racing stripes on it. I want to show it off. And you walk around now, and everybody's walking around with little right, things right, hanging right. out of their ears. We've got wires all over the place. They're showing off their earbuds. They're showing off their, their interface. They're talking to people. It would have been called schizophrenic when I was a medical student because they walk mm -hmm. around talking to themselves. Well, of course, right, they're right, right. talking over an iWatch or an iPhone right. or something like that. So, yes, we've become enormously comfortable with technology deeply integrated into our lives and our bodies. And that's a really good thing because it frees up a huge amount of design opportunities for people like us. Yeah, it makes our life easier, certainly. So you don't have to worry on having an exact anthropomorphic replica of whatever you're trying to replace. It does make uh, life easier. And, you know, people have different philosophies about the approaching these problems. And I, um, I'm all about function because I think at the, you can even say at the philosophical level, what will be mostly important and everything else is, is something you can live with. If you don't value as highly um, appearances, but of course we're a social animal and we require the approval of others. So appearances are important. This is not to say that they are not important and shouldn't be important at all for people. But uh, but if in the list of priorities, I see function as the main thing, and then appearance as as a secondary. Well, actually, appearance is still important. It's just that our cultural norms have changed. Right. That we show off technology instead of hiding it, and so having it look really cool. You know, it doesn't mean the function is one. I mean. People still want it to look really cool. 
Yeah, how yeah, many yeah. times do people buy something that's much more expensive, you know, like a large number of Apple products <laughs> that have the same function, but it looks really cool? Maybe Steve, all of them, but <laughs> yeah, Steve Jobs got this right. We're we're still into appearances, but our culture has changed so that we're not essentially literally shooting ourselves in the foot with old right. fashioned ideas about what appearance is desirable. That's completely arbitrary. Yeah. You know, cultural yeah. culture is a machine invented by humans. We get to change it. Right. So now it's touching in, in something that I, I feel I think is quite interesting because you know, Steve Jobs is seen as a innovator, which he was. My issue with his innovations is that there was something we didn't need. And that's praised as a, as a great thing, right? So you said you can create a market for something uh, that you don't need. But then the way I feel about this is there are so many actual problems. There, there are so many disabilities that we should fix and conditions and medicine to so so it's medicine as one field but we have other problems we have global warming we have all these other issues and i will i will exhort students the bright minds that come in after to focus on solving the problems that we have rather than finding products that we don't need but but you know the, the opinions here are are different so i don't know what you think about that well you know a large part of any complex economy is production and consumption for its own sake. I mean, why did the Egyptians build those pyramids? I mean, think about how much gross cost. domestic product went into putting up pyramids. You know, humans, it, they don't add any value to society. By themselves, the finished product is of no real utility, but they put a lot of people to work they generate a lot of economic turnover. You have a large population. You've got to get stuff moving. Most of what we make and sell isn't necessary for civilization. It's necessary to sustain economies and the huge number of people that we want to have in the world or that we've come to have in the world. Now, you know, obviously, if we're going to produce a lot of useless stuff, we need to make sure that we're not fouling the nest in ways that are going to affect the future. And that's the problem, of course, with global warming. Uh, but we are never going to escape the need to produce huge amounts of stuff just to sustain the economy, to, you know, fashion. I mean, it is, you know, without it, our economic systems would collapse. People would be sitting around bored and they'd have to go to war with each other to make anything out of money. Right. We don't want that. No, but, but that's a, a, you say a, a descriptive um, comment on, on what the situation is. So that's the reality. That's where we're living. And what I will yeah. try to advocate is to do a more normative view you know, without saying that this is exactly what should be done. But I, I will try to recruit more people into focusing on solving the problems that we have rather than continuing perpetuating this economical machine that just is good for the sake of consumption. So if the ancient Egyptians had had the technology to build the Aswan Dime instead of right. the pyramids, society would have been even better off. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but that took another couple of millennia. Sure, sure. And again, this is a call for people that will be listening to this, that when you, you know, what I will say is that you should at least think about um, the stuff or the products you're working on and see if they can, if they're solving a problem for humanity or taking humanity to a better place, or they're just perpetuating the consumption machinery that we we seem to be stuck. Um, but maybe we can recruit some people to <laughs> to make an improvement. Well. Thanks a lot, Jerry, for your time. It was a, it was a fun chat. I enjoyed it. Thank you.
You can subscribe to this podcast in any of your preferred platforms, that is Spotify, Audible, iTunes, or whatever it is that you use to listen to podcasts. And thanks to Dr. Enzo Mastino for the jingles.